going to move on to a discussion of Hong Kong, how the China-U.S. relationship in particular relates to what's happening in Hong Kong. I'd like to invite our moderator, Shabani Matani, to come up to stage. Shabani is the Hong Kong bureau chief for the Washington Post. She did start off uh, as a Southeast Asia senior correspondent, but like many journalists, is spending most of her time here in Hong Kong these days. Hi. Um, yes. Take, thank you very much for that, Tara. I'm Shabani, uh, the bureau chief of the Washington Post here in Hong Kong. Uh, I'd like to invite our, our panelists up on, up on stage as well. Yes. Hi, everyone. All right, so in the interest of time, uh, I'm just going to very quickly introduce my panel here. I'm conscious uh, that some of our very distinguished guests have to leave a little bit early. Um, so uh, next to me, uh, we have Mr. Daniel Fung, who served as the last Solicitor General of the British-run uh, Hong Kong and also the first Solicitor General of the Hong Kong SAR. Um, he's a delegate to the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference in Beijing, and he's also a founding chair of the Cambridge Global Conversations, which is a forum addressing uh, the challenges that humankind faces today. Um, next to him, uh, we have uh, Mrs. Regina Ip. She is... Um, of course, a member of the Hong Kong Executive Council and also a member of the Legislative Council. Uh, and she's been a, a, you know, she joined the Hong Kong government in 1975 and also served as Secretary for Security. Um, and then we have uh, Mr. Steve Vickers. He's the Chief Executive of Steve Vickers and Associates, which is a risk mitigation and a security consulting company. Uh, he specializes in risk and also spent 18 years with the Royal Hong Kong Police Force. Um, and last but not least, we have Mary Hui, who is a reporter at Quartz. She covers Asia business and, and geopolitical affairs. Previously was a freelance journalist uh, with bylines in the New York Times and the Washington Post. Um, so, um, if, if we don't mind, I think I think maybe we should get into into the questions uh, right, right away. Uh, in, in the interest of time, you know, we had a very fascinating discussion uh, when 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 we were all chatting earlier on about Hong Kong and whether its its position now um, between these two giants, uh, the United States and and China, of course. Um, is actually something that is pulling it uh, in, in a direction that makes it much more complicated for it to get out of these protests and, and the situation it's in right now. Um, maybe we can start with, with Mrs. Ip, if, if you would um, maybe make some opening remarks about how you feel about Hong Kong being sort of caught between these two powers, um, as well as the role that, that the U.S. has sort of been playing, I guess. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of rhetoric coming out uh, of, of Washington this past week and, and w what your perceptions of that are. Uh, thank you, Shibani. I'm a member of Carrie Lam's cabinet, but I'm also an elected legislator. So I'm close to government, but also close to the people. But I must stress first, whatever I say, they're purely my personal views. I'm not speaking on behalf of the government. Um, I think Daniel will have a more upbeat message to deliver. But um, I think Hong Kong is already a victim of the U.S.-China trade war, which goes beyond trade, of course, you know. I think there is also an ideological warfare going on in Hong Kong, which has been going on for a long time, you know. And I think the, the protesters and the supporters, a lot of the key opinion leaders whose commentaries I, I read every day, you know, I think some of them are emboldened by the, the U.S. pressure on China, and we have a return of the China implosion theory. That's why you have young people flying the U.S. flag, the Union Jack flag, seeking help from the U.S. and uh, U.K., but they're not going to get British passports from the, the consulates, you know. I know that too well. And, um, and I saw the, the testimony in Congress by some of our young people and the reaction of the congressman. Um, they say they stand with the Hong Kong young people because they fly the American flag and sing the American anthem. But the, the bill before, the act before Congress, is not going to do much to change the current situation. For example, some of the provisions um, urging the, the Chinese government to grant Hong Kong universal suffrage by 2020, that's not going to happen. We are already to, uh, running toward the end of 2019. I'm a constitutionalist. I think whatever we do in promoting universal suffrage 
or resolving the current crisis, we must do that in accordance with the basic law because the basic law underlines our rights and freedoms, our two systems. So um, whatever efforts uh, to undermine our government's uh, um, determination to uphold the basic law will run counter to our interests and will hurt long-term U.S.-Hong Kong relations. Uh, Daniel, you did mention to me just now that you are actually quite bullish about the situation in Hong Kong, and you do see opportunity for Hong Kong, uh, you know, even despite its its position between Washington and, and Beijing right now. Maybe you'd like to. Um, I, I think it's it's important to bear in mind that the position we find ourselves in is is not that new. Uh, why do I say that? Because since 1841, Hong Kong has always been the membrane between China and the outside world. More specifically, after 97, we, we were certainly that bridge, that window, whatever metaphor you want to use. And, and, and therefore, we're both part of China, but we are, uh, have a special status. Now, that membrane can turn into a vortex, which is what we find ourselves in. Uh, so a, a vortex is quite neutral. It could be bad, it could be, it could be uh, good. Um, Hong Kong has always been a win-win-win. Um, historically, for China, for Hong Kong, for the outside world. Uh, right now, be, because of um, certain expectations being raised, and, and because we are developed, as opposed to developing, uh, our younger generation, uh, millennials, Gen, uh, Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z, they, they, they stand at the um, apex, uh, and they they see the future as downhill. So, so we, we share the same sort of angst as the developed world, whether it's New York, London, um, Berlin, whatever. The view is downhill. In mainland China, which lives, uh, as it were, on any rational metric, far less well than Hong Kong, they're the foothills. So they, they see themselves living better than their parents, they see their children living better than them, and so on. So there, there is... A, a bullishness. Now, how, how do we switch that round? There's a big difference between 2014 and 2019. In 2014, during the umbrella of movement, um, the, the lot of the angst was economic. Um, how to get your first foot on the rung of the property ladder, jobs, um, competition from mainland China. Today, it's morphed. It's morphed into something political. Why, why do I say that? Because uh, beyond the original demands uh, which were in Kuwait, we, we have an undercurrent, which is that we've only got 28 years to go before 2047. Now, I'm not going to see 2047, but my kids are, my grandchildren are. And I, I think I speak for a lot in this room. I mean, I'm sure many of you will see 2047, unlike me, but I, I think we can all agree that the next generation will definitely see that. They want clarity. Fair enough. I mean, they, they want to live under one country, two systems. And they, they like our system, including uh, many of my friends who are immigrants from mainland China, who used to live in the Four Seasons. Now they live on the peak, you know, south side, wherever they go. Uh, now, nobody, I, I hear nobody, whether in Beijing, Hong Kong, anywhere else, arguing against one country, two systems. Nobody argues against basic law. Nobody says, I've never heard this, uh, since I started uh, participating in the drafting basically in 80s, uh, 1985. Nobody said on the stroke of midnight, June 30th, 2047, uh, we, we switched the lights off, becomes one country, one system. Nobody argues that because we, we know this mantra, Deng Xiaoping's mantra, 50 years no change, is, is not a common lawyer's draft. The Chinese precept is if it works, why fix it? So let's suck it and see. And, and therefore, if this thing uh, is successful, and I, I don't see that it, as being unsuccessful, it's going to carry on. We, we need, I, I think, a constitutional conference. We need to look into the future. That will give hope. That will change the entire dynamic of discourse between the protesters and the government, between Washington and Beijing. Uh, if we could just jump to you, Mary, for a second. Uh, I know you've been out on the streets covering the protests a lot. Maybe you can, you can try to explain to our audience here um, 
why, why do you think protesters are carrying American flags? Why do you think they're defacing the national flag? Why do you think uh, these, these sentiments are uh, playing out so strongly in the streets? And, and why do you think they, they kind of see the West as, as their hope more than, more than China? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Shivani. And I think one of the key reasons why this protest movement has gone on for so much longer and that far greater intensity and duration and, um, and, and scope and scale than anyone could have expected um, is because there's this great sense of fear, right? People, a lot of people, protesters who I've spoken to on the streets, uh, look at this protest movement um, as a fight for Hong Kong's survival. Uh, back in 2014, Daniel alluded to, there, there was a lot of um, economic anxiety, but between these two movements, between 2014 and 2019, a lot of the ideals um, are shared, the, the, the ideals of democracy and freedom, but what's different about this time around is there's this existential threat to what people hold so dear um, uh, to their hearts in Hong Kong, being the ideals of uh, uh, human rights and freedoms and, and, and the belief that, for example, um, you'll uh, be given a fair trial. And so a lot of people see these values being threatened um, and also uh, look at kind of this idea of democracy as something that needs to be fought for. And they look to countries like the US um, where this question of whether um, democracy is something to, be, to, to strive for was answered more than two centuries ago. And I think that's why um, we see protesters taking out these flags is because they look at these flags and see the values um, that they, they communicate. It's less because they want these countries to come and, and, and save Hong Kong and rescue Hong Kong. I think um, protesters are perhaps a little bit more realistic than that. Um, but they, they look at these flags and, 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 and see the values that they stand for. Steve, you're an expert on, on risk. Um, what do you think the risk is for Hong Kong right now that they're in between this, this storm, right? The, the trade war, the, the tensions between China and the US. Um, how, how do you think that sort of intensifies the risk that Hong Kong's currently facing? Well, we've got a big internal risk and we don't need it. Um, we, don't need it exam we don't need to amplify that by playing Hong Kong as a proxy card in, 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 in big power discussions between the, the US and China. It won't help the US, it won't help China, and in the end, we're, we're, both sides are going to want Hong Kong because it's very useful uh, at, at those key moments. So it, it's really critical, anyone with any, any input, that this is not a great card to be playing in the US-China uh, in the US -China negotiations. I mean, there's clearly, we've just heard a huge divergence that we're dealing with that divergence. Um, making things worse in Hong Kong you know, is not going to help anyone. I'm fearful uh, that the longer this movement goes on, the, uh, and we, dis we disagreed a little earlier about, about numbers, um, but I, my, my assessment is that the numbers are going down and violence is going up proportionally. This is not going to end happily if, we don't, uh, if, if something isn't resolved soon. The intransigence of the Hong Kong government is legendary uh, at the moment, and something needs to be done. Uh, from the protest side, if they want to gain something from what they've achieved over the last three months, then now is the time to try and cement some of that. And just demanding, we want all five demands, no talk, uh, is unlikely to result, result in, a, in a resolution. So it's, it's, it's reached a critical point for back channels and communication, uh, any assistance from friends rather than disturbance from friends to try and bring this to a, uh, a positive uh, conclusion. Uh, Mrs. Zip, you, 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 I know we were recently in Montana um, speaking to lawmakers in the U.S. about the likelihood of the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act passing. Uh, how likely do you think it is that there might be changes to the, the Policy Act and, and that this bill would pass? Um, and, I, and I do also want to ask you whether you think that there are enough channels between the Hong Kong government and, and the U.S. for, for dialogue and, and for discussion um, about all these things that are sort of looming. Well, I was in Montana end of August, and I was disappointed not to have met uh, Ambassador Bokas. You, <coughs> you were. I was told you were invited. I was looking forward to it. Anyway, the four congressmen we met: Senator Danes, Congressman Swazi, who is one of the sponsors of the Hong Kong Act, Congressman Hank Johnson, and Congressman Jen uh, Forte, also from Montana. All of them you know, struck us as having an open mind. Uh, first of all, they all pointed out that Hong Kong traditionally has been below the radar screen. 
uh, it's the current unrest which has brought us to the front page. Maybe that's why Daniel thinks it's an opportunity, you know, but for the wrong reason, in my view, you know. Um, uh, the act will have to be revised because uh, Mrs. Lam has announced withdrawal of, the, of our rendition bill. So all the sanctions targeted at people involved in, in the promoting the bill, possibly including me, you know, uh, will have to be deleted, you know. But uh, we saw on TV, you know, the, um, the congressman, a lot of them, um, um, the, the, the speaker, Ms. Pelosi, and um, various other people were very gung-ho about supporting uh, the, the Hong Kong protesters. So I think uh, things are getting rather emotional, but I draw comfort from the fact that Assistant Secretary of State, David Stilwell, uh, his words were highly measured, and he said that, Hong Kong already withdrew the bill, and Mrs. Lam started a dialogue. Actually, despite a lot of hot air, there is not a lot uh, any U.S. act could do to change the situation in Hong Kong. If there are sanctions on us, Beijing could indeed take countermeasures. And I don't think, I doubt very much, the U.S. administration will want to take away our different status, because that has been beneficial to both the U.S. and Hong Kong. But uh, I think our engagement in the U.S. is not broad enough. It's not good enough for our secretary uh, just to engage the administration. I think we need to engage more politicians and think tank and other experts uh, on, on Asia and China. And I'm, I, I'm glad the consulate here has taken the initiative to organize the first ever legislative dialogue in Montana. And I hope that would continue. Daniel, do you think that Hong Kong, um, which, as you know, uh, is not sovereign, doesn't have its own diplomats, um, do you think it, it can sort of get out of this situation, this mess that it's in by itself? Um, or, or do you think that, you know, that, that there needs to be sort of weighing in from, from these other powers? I, I, I think it's a given from, from uh, the, the premise that you've articulated, given that we don't have sovereignty. We, 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 we can't uh, do it by ourselves because we... We, we actually need coordination and we need support. We, we don't need uh, destructive dialogues. It's the last thing we need. And I, I, I don't want to be misunderstood as welcoming this crisis. I mean, nobody welcomes it. But I, I really believe that you should never let a crisis go to waste uh, because it's with us. It's, it's with us. The issues that were um, undercurrents uh, are now fully articulated. And... Uh, in very sharply, as it were, pushed um, by uh, the protesters, etc. But I, I, I do think, and I, I agree with Steve on this, that there's, there's, a, there's, there's a time and a tide to, to the affairs of men, right? So uh, I'm just quoting Shakespeare, not being sexist here. But I, I, I do think if we need to capitalize on the articulation of the issues which have to be addressed, now is the time, not to carry on forever. But we, we, we understand that when you have a mass movement uh, without, a, as it were, clear core leadership, it's very difficult to negotiate. And when, when you have positions taken, which is five demands all or nothing, uh, is usually nothing, right? Uh, and and we, we, we've seen that. We've seen that in Tunisia, we've seen that in Turkey, we, we've seen, seen that in, in the Ukraine, et cetera, et cetera. We don't want to go down that road. So I, 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 I think that, that there is a, a way forward because as I say, nobody argues against one country, two systems. Nobody uh, wants to destroy the, the basic law, save for um, a marginalized minority who advocate independence. But that, that's pie in the sky because every last drop of drinking water comes from China every day. So, uh, and the, the, the Brits, when they ran Hong Kong for 156 years, knew full well Hong Kong is indefensible. In, in military terms. So therefore, that's out of the question. Therefore, we, we do need to, to think strategically, and we do need to think in coordination. And I, I, I think the issues, having been um, surfaced in such dramatic fashion, we can't put the genie back in the bottle and say, let's solve it all by ourselves. But I do think the basic law uh, is, uh, is the criteria. Mary, do you think that for, for this young generation of, of protesters that have been really at the, at the forefront of this movement, do you think China has sort of lost them forever? 
Um, and do you think that um, that could potentially be an opportunity for, for perhaps you know, Western countries kind of look to, to shore up their influence um, in, in this part of the world? I think there's always been a very strong Hong Kong identity, um, and, and we've seen that uh, grown even more um, throughout this protest movement. Uh, we, we see it in the posters, we see it in the songs, the use of Cantonese and uh, the wordplay, um, and just the solidarity and unity um, in the, the just the, the range of protest movements, uh, protest actions that have been taken, not just marches, but also human chains, uh, and various other forms of protests, all that has kind of just really solidified uh, the sense of Hong Kong identity. And I think that then stands in clear uh, opposition to what a lot of these protesters uh, uh, see China as representing. Um, I think there is um, still opportunity for um, that bridge to be, uh, that gap to be bridged um, if there can be any kind of earnest um, concessions made from the government to um, ascertain the protections of uh, the basic law, the rule of law, um, and, and human rights in Hong Kong. And so I think uh, what we've seen is kind of this, this solidifying and intensifying of Hong Kong identity, but that, does, shouldn't, that, that doesn't need to come at the expense of, I think, um, uh, of China. Steve, um, how do you think this will all play out? Well, my crystal ball is as good as um, everybody else's. Um, I mean, I hope that we come to a resolution fairly quickly. I, I don't think much beyond October the 1st is going to be tolerated. Um, as I say, the level of violence is increasing. The numbers are going down. This is not good. Uh, we're prone to uh, agitators, or jean provocateurs, uh, and triad society influence uh, at our base. So the longer this goes on, the more dangerous the, the, the situation is. So... I, I think post 1st of October, um, there, will be, uh, there will either be some solid dialogue and, some, prof and some, some progress made, which I sincerely hope will be the case, or I think uh, the movement will run out of steam by, uh, by about Christmas, or there'll be a crackdown, mm -hmm. neither of which are happy. Uh, and I really hope that, that now is the chance, as, as, as Daniel said, now is the chance for some dialogue, and we should get on with it the next couple of weeks. And, and just as a quick follow-up, uh, do you think that any action from the United States, uh, be it tweaking the Policy Act or you know, the, the legislation that's in the works, do you think any of that will substantially change what we're seeing on the ground, or, or do you think it will just be sort of cosmetic from, from the U.S., in terms of the movement? Optics are important uh, at times like this, but in terms of significant support, no. Uh, the, the danger is all sorts of other people and all sorts of other players, not, of, not all of whom have goodwill to Hong Kong, uh, begin to begin to operate in, in, in uncertain situations. So the sooner we get this done, the better. And anybody who's got links, ability to connect people, now is the time. So I, I do think we have some polling uh, that, that, that we've conducted that we, um, that we can share that will be quite interesting to the audience. Um, and then after that, uh, I'd like to open to, to questions in the, in the interest of, of time.